This is week nine of our New Testament theology lecture series. And today we're going to be talking about Luke and Acts. Uh, and before we begin, uh, let's begin with a prayer. Dear loving God, we thank you again for the opportunity to study together, learn together. And now we're studying uh, today two very powerful books of the New Testament. Give us clear minds and ability to, to grasp the important theological points, but also to hear the voice of your Holy Spirit, that we may learn from it, uh, learn from these writings, um, information and ideas and truths uh, that will be personally helpful and helpful to our ministries. And so we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, Luke and Luke Acts. And the first part of our lecture will be on Luke, and then we'll transition to Acts. And of course, as you know, uh, the reason we're studying these two together is because we believe that the same author wrote both of these books. So we'll begin just to talk just a few minutes about context. Luke, as a theologian, wrote his account for a particular audience with a particular purpose at least according to what he wrote about here in chapter 1. And we can see here in these first few, first few verses, he says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed, <coughs> handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So in your New Testament introduction class, you should have studied a little bit about the background to Luke. And so we're not going to repeat all of that now. Uh, the only thing I'm emphasizing here is that, at least on the surface, Luke portrays his gospel as an attempt to be an historical document. And it's not, even though we know that it was written for his community decades after Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, it's written with the intention of being faithful to the oral tradition. The eyewitnesses, which would include the apostles and others that, that, that Luke might have interviewed, and their story, their witness that was passed down Maybe some of them were still living, or maybe the stories had been passed down through successive generations. We don't know. Um, but we're just pointing out here that when, you write, when Luke writes, he says he's trying to be as historical as possible. Why does he do that? He wants us to have confidence in his gospel. He wants Theophilus, whether that's a real person or a, a fictional character, we don't know. Because as you probably studied before, Theophilus literally means lover of God. So perhaps this gospel was written to all those who love God. Now, by way of interpretation, the literary unit, unity of Luke and Acts and the story it tells is a theological statement about Israel's redemptive history and God's faithfulness to Israel. That was Frank Matera's summary. And what Frank, what Frank Matera is saying, as other scholars have said, is that, once again, we should not try to read a New Testament book in isolation from its history. This is, the, the writers of the New Testament wrote about Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in light of what they inherited from the Jewish tradition. And so they very much saw what Jesus was doing as a fulfillment of the promises made to Israel to redeem the people of Israel. And of course we know it's broader than that. It was also universal. Yet, point number two, is there not also a subversive element to the story of Jesus as it is told? Franciscan Dr. Richard Rohr, he, he's a, a man who's living now who's uh, uh, been a Franciscan monk for many years and published many books. And uh, his interpretation of the story of Jesus, not just Luke, but generally speaking, but I think it applies especially to Luke. He says, 
In Jesus, we have an almost extreme example of God taking sides. It starts with one who empties himself of all divinity. See Philippians 2, 6 and 7. He comes as a homeless baby in a poor family. Then a refugee in a foreign country. Then an invisible carpenter in his own country. Which is colonized and occupied by an imperial power. He ends up as a quote-unquote criminal accused and tortured by heads of both systems of power, temple and empire, abandoned by the most of his inner circle, subjected to the death penalty by a most humiliating and bizarre public ritual, crucifixion, and finally buried quickly in an unmarked grave. If God in any way planned this storyline, God surely intended the message to be subversive, clear, and unavoidable. Yet we largely have made Jesus into a churchy icon that any priestly or policing establishment could gather around without even blushing. Again, I don't know if you follow his line of thinking, but what Richard Rohr is trying to say here is, because of traditional Christianity and how it's developed over the years, so many of us, and I've been in so many homes where there's a nice picture of a sort of European looking Jesus on the wall, and he's a good shepherd. And, and we, nobody feels threatened by that Jesus. We feel warm toward that Jesus, perhaps. And we love that Jesus, and we believe Jesus loves us. Well, that's true to the teaching of Scripture. But what Richard Rohr is trying to say is, if we really read the Gospels carefully, is that there is a fierce side to Jesus that's not just a gentle shepherd in, in the pasture land. And the fierceness is, is partly in how he, he challenged the religious authorities, but also in his words and his teachings and how they challenged the status quo. And how he demanded that those who believe in God and those who follow him do something to make a difference in the world. That's the testimony of Luke and Acts. Now what exactly they should be doing? Well, that's what we have to look for. That's what we should be, be studying here. Um, but what he's trying to say here, what he's emphasizing for us, is that Jesus was in a context of marginalization, oppression, uh, injustice, struggle, poverty. And isn't that the situation that many of you find yourselves in today? How, are you, how will you respond to that? What is the message of Luke and Acts to you in your context? Because do not think that your context is different from Jesus' context. It's really in many ways the same. And so the message here is to people who should understand what it's like to live in those circumstances. So what does he say? All right, well, let's go on now to, to special features. First of all, Luke is non-exclusive. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be non-exclusive? Well, it simply means that the Gentiles, as well as the Jews, are now part of this promise. Now, for us today, most everybody, everybody in this room, as far as I know, is Gentile. Most of the people who are watching this uh, as, a, as a digital recording are probably also Gentiles. Gentiles simply means not Jews. So that's the vast, vast majority of the world. Well, in Jewish, ancient Jewish thinking, the promises of God were only for them. And so what Luke wants to make clear is that with Jesus... The message is certainly for the Jews, doesn't exclude them, but it opens up to the entire world. So we see some examples. Let's look, first of all, to Luke 2.32. So there in the temple, Simeon, it came time for the purification rites required by the law of Moses. This is probably on the eighth day of Jesus' life. Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the prophets, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. 
Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. All right, that's a clue. Consolation of Israel. Consolation is the, is the restoration of Israel. Israel who was under the bondage of the empire, the Roman Empire. Uh, the consolation means the reestablishment of Israel. And he says that he was waiting for that and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required, that's circumcision, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. So here you see that the, the message Luke is saying through Simeon's mouth is that the, Jesus fulfills a promise that extends to the Gentiles. Let's also notice something about the genealogy. In Luke chapter 3, we have the genealogy of Jesus, and it begins in verse 23. And as you may remember, when we talked about Matthew, is Jesus comes down through the line of Joseph. And, excuse me, but the, it begins with whom? Do you remember? Abraham. Abraham, good. It begins with Abraham and mentions David and then many others. And as we said in our last session, that the point of that was to say Jesus really is a Jew and he's, he's from the royal line and he is the Messiah. But now here, Luke starts with Joseph and works backwards. All right, they're still both interested in Joseph, but they follow, you know, they go in a different direction and there's even some different names in the list. But again, in our, our, for our purposes, we're not doing New Testament introduction. We're not going to try to figure out that mystery right now. Uh, but we're going to talk about the significance, theological significance, of what Luke does. So let's look. As if you start with Joseph, and we start going backwards to, to Heli and Mathat and, and Melchi, and on and on and on. And we keep going all the way until we get to verse 31. The son of David. So he also gets to David. Just as Matthew came down to David, Luke goes up to David. But then Luke keeps going backwards to Jesse and, and Bo Boaz and Salmon and Nashon. You notice there's no mention of whom? Do you remember what we said yesterday or last week? David. Well, David's there. Okay. But remember, we, who was. Uh, Boaz's wife uh, Ruth. Ruth no mention of Ruth here no mention of all are Judas the son, all are the son of whom yeah they're all the son of whom but who's missing then from this list women yes yeah, the four women that were mentioned in Matthew's list so another reason why I said last time that we should pay attention to that because Matthew clued to those women for some reason Luke doesn't think it's important. So Luke has a different agenda, is what that means. But notice that he keeps going back, and he goes back, and look, verse 34, he gets to Abraham. So, here's Matthew, going from Abraham all the way down to Jesus. Luke starts with, with, with Jesus, goes all the way back to Abraham, but then what does he do? Keep going. Keeps going all the way back to... God. Yeah, all the way back to Adam, and then God. What might be the significance of going all the way back to Adam? What do you think he's trying to say? Yes, he's a descendant of God, just like the whole human race is. But what's the significance of going all the way back to Adam instead of stopping at Abraham? Abraham is the father of whom? Israel. Adam is the father of all human race. And so scholars typically will say 
that, or speculate that the reason Luke goes all the way back to Adam is to say this gospel is universal. It's for the whole world. Matthew was less concerned about that. I mean, now Matthew, at least, at least at the point of the genealogy, Matthew clearly gets to the Gentiles. But Luke, from the beginning, wants to say, Jesus goes all the way back to God and Adam. All right. Uh, point number three. Luke also wants to emphasize that the prophet is not accepted in his own country. Let's look at these very well-known verses in Luke chapter 4. Uh, just as I said, in Matthew 25 is often quoted from Matthew. So the verses in Luke are, chapter 4 are often uh, the ones quoted if somebody's quoting Matthew. Uh, excuse me, Luke. And so there he's teaching in the synagogue. He goes to Nazareth, his hometown. And as was his custom, he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. And Shaya, would you read Luke 14? 18. Beginning 18, yes. So here, and we'll come back to this again. In those first verses, we, we find the, the quotation from Isaiah as a, as a program for Jesus. And so many people look to these verses as an as a explanation of Jesus' idea of his own mission. And he's come, the Spirit has anointed him to proclaim good news to the poor, proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so this is good news. This, this is the gospel, according to Luke, that there's good news for the world. And God is going to do many things. And you can see the strong social component to this. Uh, Jesus, God cares very much about those who are poor and struggling. And we've said that before and we will we'll say it again. And so far, so good. And when everybody is listening to him in his own hometown, they are, uh, they are very pleased. What gracious words come from this man. But the story doesn't end there, does it? What happens next? Well, let's go down here. He says the scripture is fulfilled in their hearing. So he's clearly saying, this is fulfilled in my life and ministry. But then, pick it up in 23, how quickly things can change. So one moment they're saying, oh, what a blessed son of our community with these gracious words. What made them so angry? How did, why did things turn? Yeah, it was something about, he quoted scripture, and what, what were the stories he told? Verse 25, they said there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. Yet, verse 26, Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. So you might not realize, but that's outside of Israel. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Elisha followed Elijah. So it's Elijah, then Elisha. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. What's he saying? God in the old times, God helped people outside of Israel. You see, what, what the typical Israelite wanted to hear was that the, the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets gave a great promise of God's redemption for Israel. And when God's Messiah would come, what they expected is that he would restore and show favor to Israel. And yet here Jesus stands up and basically says, I am that Messiah. He didn't use that word, but he basically says, I'm the promised one. And you're going to ask me to do something that I'm not going to do because you're not going to accept me because I'm one of your own. And then in fact, we should see that God actually is going to go out to people outside of Israel, just as he did back in Elijah and Elisha's day. And that's why they're furious. And what, what Luke is telling us by this story, and this, Luke, this story is coming very early, he places it very early in his narrative, is it foreshadows what we're going to see in Luke, in, in Acts, also written by Luke. That the gospel was taken first to the Jews, who by and large rejected it, not completely, but by and large did.
And so, as a result, Paul, who tried to preach to the Jews but was rejected, wound up going to the Gentiles. And so, this, see how this foreshadows that? That means it's, it's telling you early on that this kind of dynamic of bringing the good news to the, to the Jews but being rejected, just as Jesus was rejected by the Jews, is also going to play out in the gospel ministry of the apostles. They're going to go to the Jews, and, only, and some will believe, but many will not. And then the message is going to go to the Gentiles. But it's not completely new, because the same thing happened with Elijah and Elisha. All right? Now, point number four, it's also an in inclusive message. We're, ta we're talking about special features in Luke. And... And this fourth one is an inclusive message. Repentance and forgiveness is to be preached to all nations. And uh, notice here in Luke 24, this is the very end of the gospel. And Jesus has already died and been resurrected. Uh, but here, this is on the road to Damas uh, Emmaus. Remember the road to Emmaus? Jesus comes along in secret and walks with the two disciples. And in verse 45, he says, Then he opened their minds so that they could understand scripture, the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. All right, then he goes on to say other things. Uh, but I'm emphasizing this here. Uh, so let, let me just put those two verses up to, Although there are many stories in Luke, just as there are many stories in Mark and in Matthew, we're always looking for clues as to what is Luke's, in this case, Luke's theology. What does he conclude from all of these stories? Is he just going to tell us, as Matthew did, that, that this is what Jesus taught, this is how we should live? Um, well, he's going to do some of that. He will. But by the end, he's going to give us a message, just as Matthew did in chapter 28. He finally gives us a message of how we as the readers are supposed to, to, to interpret this, the whole book. And he's saying, this is the message. The Messiah is going to suffer and, and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins is going to be preached to all nations. So what do you notice just from the, these two verses? What are the key elements of this gospel message, according to Luke? Well, first of all, Jesus is the Messiah. So there's a connection to the Old Testament. What else? What? He's going to rise from the third dead. So resurrection is part of the gospel message. But before that, he's going to suffer. And his suffering included death. And so, preaching Jesus as the Messiah, that's a fulfillment of the Old Testament expectation. Plus, he's going to suffer and rise from the dead. So, th those were new elements. Now, now, the early church saw the, the prediction of the suffering of Christ in Isaiah chapter 53. So, it, it is in the Old Testament. But in Jesus' day, the expectation for the, for the Messiah, at least one major uh, tradition or one major stream of thought, was that the Messiah was going to become a political ruler. So there wasn't going to be a suffering Messiah. He was going to take up arms, maybe, maybe even overthrow the, the empire, and become the ruler. But that's not what Luke concludes. He says, yes, he is the Messiah, but this Messiah is one who's going to suffer and die and be resurrected. And then, what's going to be preached about him? I mean, the first is who he was. He's the Messiah. He suffers and he's resurrected. Now in verse 47, what is the message? Forgiveness, Forgiveness of sins. For those who repent. For those who repent. All right? So, so again, this is so rich in theology. It's about Christology and it's about soteriology. And it's about the expectation for those who become disciples of Christ. All in two verses. Because it's the summary. That's why we're doing point by point here. 
So again, I know I repeat myself, but I really want it to sink into your minds that I want you to develop your New Testament theology, your, your biblical theology, knowing what it is in distinction from alternatives. Because those alternatives are being preached and taught in different places, even in this country. And I want you to recognize that when you hear a distortion of the gospel, that you'll recognize it as such. It may be well-intentioned. The, the, the preacher might be sincere. But if it's an incomplete gospel message, you need to be ready to raise your hand and say, well, let's not forget repentance. Let's not forget forgiveness of sins. Let's not forget social gospel. Because all of them are taught here in Luke. And then finally, uh, well, this is going to be preached. That means we have to declare it and call people to believe it. But it's to all nations. And there's that inclusive scope. Now, inclusive does not mean that everybody's going to be saved. That's universalism. That's not what we mean by inclusive. Inclusive means that this gospel message is open to everyone on the planet. But those, it's only going to be beneficial to those who repent and believe and receive the forgiveness of sins. All right, Harry doesn't mention baptism. But baptism is going to come in Acts, don't worry. So he, it's not that he has a different gospel. He's just not emphasizing it at this place in his writing. All right, and then one other distinctive point that might be uh, worth mentioning here, point number five in your guide, is that whoever is not for you, who, excuse me, whoever is not against you is for you. However, later on in, in Luke chapter 11, he says, whoever is not for you is against you. <laughs> so, so we have these two statements uh, that appear to be contradictory or, or exclusive to one another. Um, but the unique characteristic is the, it's really the first statement, because Matthew said the second one. But the first one, uh, I guess it's not entirely unique, because Mark also says it. But whoever is not against you is for you. That's an inclusive statement. Uh, and that's part of what, he, what Luke wants to say. All right, we don't need to say anything more about that. But let's go ahead to, to point number B. Another important uh, feature, I mean, the first feature was the non-exclusive status. Those were all examples of the non-exclusive character of the gospel. Now, the second special feature of Luke is a high value on those with low social status. God loves everyone, but especially extends mercy and grace to the lowly, which includes women, and the sick, and the oppressed, and sinners, etc. And we can find many examples here in the text. Uh, Elizabeth, who was a barren woman. The announcement of the Savior to Mary, a humble woman. Jesus' ministry to focus on those with physical and social problems, which are included in the Sermon on the Plain. Let's just look at, at, at a couple of verses there quickly. Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 21. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Now, in Matthew's gospel, do you remember how he how he talks? Matthew says, Blessed are you who are poor in spirit. Blessed are you who hunger for righteousness. All right, so in other words, Matthew makes it more spiritual. We don't know which is the original. Is, is the longer one original or is the shorter one original to Jesus? We have no way of knowing. But we can notice that for Luke, he really means the poor. He really means the hungry. He really means those who are mourning. Uh, this, is, this is why I love Luke. Because it's so clear to me, and this is why so many, especially in, in wherever I go in the developing countries, so many who are struggling, suffering, see in Luke an advocate. They see someone who understands their suffering, who, who is preaching a message or portraying Jesus in a way that sounds like he understands them and cares about them. So, now point number four at the same time, Luke's concern is not only material, 
physical. He's also concerned about the spiritual. Why do I say that? Because in Luke 11, 13, we find that when Jesus is talking about um, God's love, he says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake? He implied nobody, right? If, you ask, if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, again, he's not talking about, excuse me, talking about normal fathers, will, will treat their children with, with love and kindness. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your, will your Father in heaven give what? the Holy Spirit to those who seek Him. So, again, just to emphasize the spiritual nature of Luke's Gospel, that when you're interpreting this and applying this in your context, you, you, you must include the spiritual to do justice to Luke. So by all means, use Luke to say that God cares about the poor, the hungry, the oppressed, the prisoner, those who are suffering from injustice, the marginalized, by all means. But do not then take another step and say, and then the main point is to preach for, for physical, material liberation, and that Jesus was concerned just about social change or political change. Because that's really not the flow the flow of the gospel from Luke to Acts is that God cares about those who are suffering. But the good gift that, that ultimately that, that comes through Christ and faith in Christ is the Holy Spirit. And it's the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of those who suffer, rich or poor, just or unjust, uh, man or woman, whatever the issue may be, in power, out of power. The real gift of God is, is God's presence with us through Christ's Spirit. That is what transforms people. That's what can transform the world. Here he's just pointing to it in Luke chapter 11. By the time we get to Acts, it becomes very clear that the pouring out of the Holy Spirit is very critical to the development of the church. All right, uh, let's go to the next point here. Uh, so, so far we had two points, special features of Luke. It is non-exclusive, and B, high value on those with a low social status. A third special emphasis is on prayer and the Holy Spirit. Now, I've already mentioned the Holy Spirit. But, but notice here how often prayer is mentioned in Luke. Prayer surrounds the key events in, in chapter 3. Let, let me throw these up on the screen for us to look at. Luke 3, 21, chapter 6. Verse 12, 9, 18, uh, 9, When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. As he was praying, heaven was opened. Luke 6, one of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Luke 9, once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? Luke 9, 29, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. And so we see multiple references to the importance of prayer in Luke. So again, when we're talking about trying to understand the, the spirituality of Luke, it's so well grounded in real life material circumstances and yet it's deeply spiritual at the same time. He's praying to God, he's reaching out to God, asking God for help, seeking the, the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's doing. And then, of course, many references in Acts that I'm not going to reference now. And then the Holy Spirit is God's means of working in Jesus and the church. And we're gonna come back to that again later. Okay, the fourth special feature of Luke is the theme of reversals. Reversals. Uh, let's look at chapter 1, verses 51 through 51, 51 through 53. So here in this context, uh, we have this prayer. This is Mary's prophecy. 
you know, after after the announcement that she's going to be uh, pregnant through the Holy Spirit, uh, the mother of Jesus, she gives this prophecy. Okay. Can, can you see the reversal theme in these verses? Because you realize in any societal structure, there are certain people who are on top and certain people who are on the bottom. And then, and then in, in the West, some of the Western society, there's a big middle group. But in many underdeveloped countries, there's not a big middle group. It is most, of, most of the people are on the bottom, and there's a few on the top. Well, what's characteristic, characteristic of the people on the top? Well, they have the power, they have the money, right? And they're the rulers. And so what is he saying in these verses? Is that when the Messiah comes, he's going to accomplish mighty deeds, but scattering those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. So that's a reversal. They're proud, they're established, now they're scattered. The rulers are on their thrones, and he brings them down. The humble are low. What does he do? Lift them up. The hungry are... The hungry is like, my stomach is empty. And they're going to be filled. So it's reversal. And the rich who have everything are sent away empty. Reversal. Reversal of what you see normally. Reversal of the, of the, natu of the, the typical order of society. So you can see, that, back to Richard Rohr's comment, that this is a, a subversive, challenging gospel. He's really saying it's God's intention to upset the order. Now, I'm not teaching you know, political revolution or anything like that. I'm just trying to teach you what the, the book says, what the theology and the understanding of Luke was. That the Savior, Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of Israel's hope is going to be a powerful force in society, mixing things up. But not on behalf of one ethnic group to the expense of another, or one gender to the expense of the other. That's what human beings do. It's really, a, it's really for the benefit of those who are suffering. They're the ones who are going to be cared for. All right. Uh, and then he goes on, uh, other examples of reversal uh, are Jesus' prophetic mi ministry. Uh, here uh, we can see, uh, oh, maybe I, I think, I, I'll, just, I'll just refer you to your guide. There are many individuals or groups who are contrasted. The Pharisee and the tax collector, the wealthy versus the poor and the maimed were invited to the banquet. The wealthy were invited, they didn't come. He says, go out in the streets and bring in the poor. The rich man and Lazarus, the beggar at the gate, after, after they both die, what, where does the rich man go? To hell, to hell or Hades. The Lazarus goes to the bosom of Abraham, which is paradise or what we call today heaven. All right. Uh, religious leaders versus Gentiles. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Okay. And then we see that the lowly Jesus, born in a manger, you know, born outside because there was no room for him in the inn. This one becomes elevated to the Lord, become the Lord, and become Christ, the one in whom forgiveness is preached. Can you imagine such a thing? Can you imagine such a thing? That somebody was so poor, somebody so marginalized, becomes now the ruler of all. And the rulers and the leaders of Jerusalem are to be humbled, according to Jesus' teaching. And then he says, the kingdom of God is among you already, and yet it's still ahead. So here we have the kingdom of God is, is, is present, but yet there's still quite a bit ahead. But the point of those different examples are, are to say... Uh, the expectation is, is that those who put their trust in Jesus are going to experience real hope, especially those who are marginalized, especially those who are hungry or needy, that there is hope for, for all those who put their hope in Him, put their trust in Him. That's the message. All right, finally, in terms of special features, 
Let's talk about soteriology. Salvation is now in Jesus' ministry uh, for Israel. Through Christ, God shows mercy to Israel, gives his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, and guides their feet into the path of peace. And here we see in, in Luke chapter 1, verses 69 to 79, that um, it says, He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he said long ago through his holy prophets, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, to, re to the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of the enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. Now, these are beautiful, beautiful words. And we have here this, this uh, prophecy uttered over, over Jesus, talking about all that would come about through him. So in short, this is what salvation means. Uh, there's much hope, but the hope is rooted in, for Luke, forgiveness of sins, really. It's spiritual. And in that forgiveness of sins, we are freed, but not to do our own will, but freed to serve the one who's forgiven us. And so what, another way to, to say what I've been trying to emphasize here is that this context into which Jesus came, the context of ancient Israel, was a context in which there was a covenant with Israel, a promise that the, the Israel would one day be restored and saved completely. And that salvation for them was very physical and material. But Luke says that the real meaning of salvation is spiritual, is forgiveness. It frees us to be able to serve God without fear. And in that service, we may be strong and confident, whole and healthy, even powerful, because of the tender mercy of God. Because His light has shined on those living in darkness, meaning sometimes darkness means evil and sinfulness. Sometimes darkness means hopelessness. But they were in the shadow of death as a way of life. But it guides them into a path of peace. And here it seems to me that the the intention is really an internal peace, a peace with God that lasts for eternity. Now, point number two here is the salvation through faith in the risen Christ and through the Holy Spirit ultimately comes in the end times. But as we're going to see in Acts, those end times have already come about. With the coming of the Holy Spirit, that inaugurated the end times. So, so, they, so this, this, these promises were already partly a reality. And then three, salvation is consummated when the Messiah returns and fully establishes the kingdom on earth. So with Jesus comes the kingdom. He shows the power of the kingdom. He promises more ahead. We receive more after his death and resurrection through the Holy Spirit. But the ultimate fulfillment of the promise, the ultimate salvation is what comes when he returns again and establishes his kingdom on earth. That's the full gospel of Luke. All right, are there any questions about these main features? The five main features that we talked about. All right, now let's then just talk about world of values. This, this, this is adapted from my professor, David Rhodes, and I referenced him when we talked about Mark a couple weeks ago. And uh, David Rhodes has done a lot of work with the Gospels, and, and when he teaches on Luke, 
he thinks it's important to identify the values that we find in the text. And so some of these come from him and some of them are my own adaptation of his work. But he identifies essentially uh, three major values, but also then adds a fourth discussion about the means of transformation in the world. First of all, he says there's a contrast of justice, uh, excuse me, justice is a value, but it comes through the judgment of God. We find in Luke that God pronounces judgment on exploitation, neglect, and injustice. Let's, let's look at one of those examples. In Luke chapter 12, verses 41 through 48. Let's have somebody read those for us. Okay, so, so what message do you get from, from this teaching of Jesus? So we have an expectation from God of, of stewardship. That's the word that's typically used today. Stewardship. Extremely important word, word for discipleship. Stewardship means management. Okay? So to be a good steward means to be a good manager of whatever resources God has given us. If God gives us a good intelligence, a good mind, then we have a responsibility to use our mind for good. If God gives us a good education, we have an obligation to use that education. If God gives us money, we have an obligation to be a good manager of that money so we don't waste the money, but instead we use it for good purposes. See, and on down the line. If God gives us administrative responsibilities where we're supposed to care for people, it could be caring for children, it could be caring for uh, fellow students, it could be caring for people in our church. What does God expect? If, if He gives us responsibility to take care of children or, or student, fellow students or or for church members, what does he expect of us? What, what is the principle? The principle is if he gives us a, a responsibility to take care of others, we must take care of them well. That's the principle. All right? And, and we all know examples of those who are in positions of, of, of management or leadership who don't care for their their employees. They don't care for the children properly. They don't care for the students properly. Now, we don't say that to, to judge anyone else, but to say that, that Jesus is saying, if you're given responsibility, you must be a good, you must be responsible. And if you're not responsible, what's going to happen? Punishment. Punishment. We call that judgment. And then, so that's why David Rhodes says justice, and that means people being treated fairly and right. Here, the story are, are, the, are the servants in this household. But we can say it, it's the children in our home, the students in our school, the people in our churches, the people in our communities and villages. These are the, the people that are supposed to be treated fairly, justly, kindly. And those who are in positions of authority have an obligation to treat them right. You and I have an obligation before God to handle our responsibilities right. And, and if God gives us more responsibility, then we have more obligation. All right? So more blessing in terms of money, education, position, resources, is not for us. What God gives to us is only partly for us. It's really so that we will do the work of God in the world. And that, and that right now, there are some people who take that very seriously and work hard to be good stewards, good managers. But there are others who don't. And Luke is saying someday they will be judged by God. And so that's the value system here, that's, that the God pronounces judgment on anybody who's exploiting people or mistreating them or neglecting them. Now the proclamation of the kingdom is good news for those who repent, and it's bad news for those who don't. And so remember that it, when we find in any of the Gospels, 
but especially the synoptic gospel, this, this emphasis on preaching, is calling for repentance. The assumption is that all of us need to repent. All right, so maybe all of us have been, been poor stewards at times. Maybe we have been unjust, or we've exploited somebody else, or we've mistreated somebody. Right? That's, that's the human condition. But the message of good news is that there's still hope for us if we repent. But if we don't repent, there's bad news for us. There's going to be judgment. So again, what, what, we, what I want us to, to see here in the Synoptic Gospels especially is that misinterpretation of Paul that all that matters is accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior and then I'm going to go to heaven is an incomplete gospel. Because the gospel writers say how we live is extremely important. But as you know already, Paul also believed that. Um, now, point number three, under, under justice via judgment, is that God will right the wrong. Vindication is coming. Justice will prevail in the end. And so here we, we go here to Luke chapter 18, beginning in, in verse 28. And Peter said to Jesus, We have left all to follow you. And Jesus said to him, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Okay, and so those who sacrifice um, will be rewarded. Those who have been mistreated, they'll be vindicated. And so the, Luke is full of this language that things will be made right in the end. And so, we don't find in Luke teaching that says it's up to you to make things right in the world. Now, if you're a steward, a manager, then it is up to you to do right. But to change all of the injustice in the world is, is, is not a, a mission that God gave you, necessarily. And maybe He gave it to, to, to a few of you, I don't know. But generally speaking, what we find in the New Testament is that the real hope for justice is what God's going to do at the end of time. We do what we can, but the ultimate hope is what God is going to do in the end. All right, so that's the first value, justice. God does value justice. We have to do it, but He will also do it at the end. Number two, Putting God first leads to social justice. Neglect and oppression of others stems from wrong priorities. They don't put obedience to God first. Now there are so many examples here of that. Let me throw a few of these verses onto the screen for us to look at. The ones I have mentioned here in the text. Okay, La Rache, would you read some of these verses for us? Okay, let's just pause on that one. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. I had somebody tell me once, wasn't it a good thing if everyone speaks well of me? What he's trying to say is, if you're in a position to do what's right or to challenge what's wrong and you keep silent, you do nothing. And everybody thinks, oh, he's a wonderful person. But he doesn't stand out and speak against injustice. He says, that, that's how the ancestors treated the false prophets. In other words, those in power, he means, liked the false prophets. Because the false prophets didn't point out their faults. They just said, oh, you're a great ruler. God will bless you. And, of course, everybody wants that kind of message. But if we're doing what's wrong... It is better if we hear somebody tell us what you're doing is wrong. You remember the story of Nathan and David? After David took Bathsheba, had committed adultery with her and had her husband killed. And he tells the story about, about a man who 
who took the only little lamb of a poor person. And, and, and David was enraged. He said, that man should die. <laughs> and what did Nathan say to him? He says, you are that man. And so you can imagine. Well, David didn't want to hear that message, but David needed to hear that message. So Nathan was not a false prophet. He was a true prophet. And so that, there's an example from the Old Testament of the opposite of what Jesus is talking about. So he says, woe to you if everybody thinks, oh, he's a nice prophet, he's a nice minister. You know, he's, a nice, he's so nice about everything. Well, sometimes we have to challenge what's wrong. That's what's behind that verse. Okay, read the next one, please. Okay, let's pause on those two. Again, what he's trying to say here is that the Pharisees didn't understand who Jesus was. Jesus was willing to, to be touched by a woman who... Uh, was a sinner who committed adultery and and then the, he was criticized. He said, look, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. He's unclean. You know, one of the, the big issues is, that's been a struggle in the United States, in the church in the United States over the last, oh, I don't know, 20, 30 years has been the issue of AIDS. Now the AIDS is something that was that spread wildly among homosexuals. Not exclusively, but wi wildly. And it was due to homosexual practice and what we call today unsafe sex. Right? Well, some Christians said, why should we take pity on them? This is God's judgment on them. And we shouldn't, we, why should we care for them? And uh, they're getting what they deserve. Whereas others said, well, even if it is God's judgment, even if this is a result of sinful behavior, and not everybody believes that it is, but many do, they said still mercy and compassion means that we should reach out to them and try to provide comfort, do research to find uh, remedies for this, this disease uh, so that uh, we can help these people who are suffering. And so, it's just a modern day example of what was taking place in Jesus' day. There were the Pharisees who had no compassion for the sinners. Though those people were having trouble, it's their own fault. So we have nothing to do with them. But then there's Jesus, who probably agreed with them from a, from a, religion, from a, a legal point of view. He knew very well that they were suffering because of their sin. Sin always produces suffering. But still, he recognized that they needed help. Elsewhere we read that Jesus said, the physician does not come for those who are well, but for those who are sick. And so we as spiritual leaders, Luke is saying, should not just come for the righteous, but for those who need our help and need our message. That was Jesus' mindset. And so again, what, our, what uh, Professor Rhodes is saying is that if we have obedience to God and we have the mindset of God in our mind, we will reach out to those who are suffering. Under this as well, number two is the wealthy are singled out as hoarders and exploiters. Let's look at, uh, we looked at one of these verses already, but let's, let's back it up and start with 24 and go to 26. And so, do you, you know what that word woe means? Okay, woe is like, like uh, this, is, this is a statement of warning and, and even condemnation, judgment. Like, woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Why, why would he offer these words of judgment against the rich, the well fed, those who are laughing? Those who, for whom everyone <laughs> speaks well, and now you're laughing. Woe to you! <laughs> no, so what, is he, what do you think he means? Luke is saying, blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry. And then he says, woe to those who are well fed. I think the implication to me is, he's talking about those who have but don't share. Mm -hmm. Those who take care of themselves, but don't care for those who don't. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Mm 
I don't believe Jesus was against rich people. Yeah. I don't think he was against people who are well fed. <laughs> because I think most of you in this room are well fed. Yeah. So you're all immediately <laughs> eliminated. <laughs> Woe to you. No, I, that, he, I don't think he wants us to be malnutritioned. <laughs> okay? He doesn't want you to stop laughing, be serious. Some people think that's what he means. No. The idea is that we're so full of laughter. And uh, Have you ever seen, I don't know if you've ever seen in your community just drunk people laughing, yeah. laughing away. They're all so full of themselves, but sometimes that can turn to violence. Sometimes that can just turn to uh, neglect of their children or crying in the other room. Uh, we can become so self-consumed that our laughter is not about joy. It's about just being full of ourselves. I think that's what this is really about. So don't take these literally you know, in the extreme, but try to understand what he's talking about. He says we have to care. That's what it means to really be a person of God. You have to care about other people who are suffering. Israel's leaders also showed an arrogant use of power. And there are many examples here. I'm just going to have to go on. Uh, because of time, but the world of values then is justice. Putting God first leads to social justice, meaning caring for those who, su who suffer. Three, mercy. Um, and we've talked about mercy before, but Jesus is the one who embodies God's mercy shown to Israel, is the prime example of how we are to treat others. You know, he's eating with the sinners. He's touching uh, the, the, the sinners and the, the, the poor. Uh, he's talking to the women who are, who are lower class in his society. Examples of mercy are, are a sign of repentance. So if you truly repent, the result of that will be that you will show mercy. When Zacchaeus repented and put his faith in Christ, he immediately said, I will repay those I have cheated four times over, and then I will give money to the poor. Right, so see how that flow. That, that's a contrast now to what I've called earlier false gospel or, or a misinterpretation of Paul where we preach salvation is by grace through faith alone. If you accept Jesus as your Savior and are baptized, you'll go to heaven forever. And, and the mentality in, this, in the false version is that I receive for myself and I have the benefit in the next life. And that's the whole gospel. That is so far from Luke's gospel. He would say, yes, by all means, you receive forgiveness out of the mercy of God. He agrees 100% with the first part. He agrees with the second part. That in the future, God will return. For those who put their faith in Christ, trusting God for forgiveness, they will forever experience God's blessing. He agrees. But he adds a critical third part. And that is, for those who truly know God, they will then show the same love and mercy and graciousness to other people. This is not an option. It's not, you know, like an extra benefit. <laughs> you know, if, for those who are more mature, you can do this. No. Our gospel should be from the beginning. You put your faith in Christ. You are committing yourself to repent and to serve Christ and serve others. That's what Luke is teaching. Uh, so mercy is part of that. Zacchaeus is an example. Um, only Luke gives instructions to everyone to sell possessions and give alms. Finally, the means of transition and transformation. Jesus' message is that God is merciful. We may have salvation through the forgiveness of sins and find the path of peace. Yet sinners must repent of their sins as I've been saying all, all day. Two, disciples are commissioned with the same message, but in the name of Christ. Jesus' role does not disappear with his death, but expands to that of Lord in Christ, in whose name the message of the kingdom continues to be preached. Three, God's cataclysmic intervention and judgment, that means at the end of time when God comes into history forcefully, that's cataclysmic, will affect these reversals. That's when these reversals are going to take place. Four, while some sort of dramatic eschatological fulfillment of the message, 
is still envisioned, present repentance, including social activism, is the emphasis in Luke. And then finally, five acts, transformation comes through faith and the Holy Spirit. And when we turn our attention to Acts, um, we're going to talk about all those things. Can we turn our attention now to the book of Acts? And so, as we've been saying, and as you know, Luke also wrote Acts. And so we find here, as we see on the screen here, in the very first verse, the words, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about, I wrote all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up unto heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Okay, so we'll stop there. But this is the literary link between the Gospel of Luke and now the second book that we call the Acts, Acts of the Apostles. And, uh, and so, as we look at this, in short, in terms of the theological message of Acts, what we're going to see is that the Holy Spirit is the power that orients a person toward God, creates Christian community, and enables social inequities to be redressed. That means attended to or, or corrected with mercy, including even promoting an egalitarian spirit and inclusive practices. So that in a short version, and there's, there's so much more in, in Acts than that, um, but I really want to emphasize the role of the Holy Spirit, which was pointed to in Luke. And we even have here in verse 2, that it says that Jesus gave instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles. We don't even know what he means exactly by that. But we can be clear, can be sure that what he's saying is the Holy Spirit is very important. Very important in terms of how we experience Jesus Christ after his resurrection. And uh, so we'll just leave it at that for now. So let me just make a few general comments. Acts as theology, or, or what, a, what is the purpose or the purposes of, of, the, of Acts? Acts is a, is a theological history devoted to showing the nature and power of the gospel to the vital role of the Holy Spirit in the life and mission of the church as a power source and a validator of the legitimacy of the church and the message. Christianity is the true Judaism, according to Luke. It's worthy of respect. It's worthy of protection. And it's worthy of acceptance by the Gentiles, including the Romans. So in that sense, Luke might have been a defense or an apology to Roman authorities. Uh, again, we don't know for sure. Uh, but that's, uh, that's certainly part of the message that comes through. And Acts is also a testimony of the unimpeded spread of the gospel. In other words, the gospel was preached in Jerusalem and it, and it began to spread and, and nothing could stop it. And so that's, th these are some of the messages of, of Acts. Now according to Frank Matera, when we combine Luke and Acts together, it narrates a single story of redemptive history rooted in Israel's history and God's plan of salvation. He also says, the story is a story of a gracious offer of salvation that is rejected and then offered to others. It's rejected by the Jews primarily and then offered to the Gentiles. Those who accept are the re-established Israel. And this is uh, probably what influenced by Paul's theology, is that the, those who accept Jew and Gentile together become the reestablished Israel. This is a highly debated point in terms of really Paul's understanding and Luke's understanding, but for this class, this is how I'm going to teach the class, that that, that is essentially what Luke's view is. Now the main themes of the book are introduced 
in verses 4 through 8 of chapter 1. So let's look at those quickly. So what, what, what are the main messages of those verses? The Holy Spirit, for sure. And they had to wait for the Holy Spirit. So th this is a good time to make a comment that uh, in all of my years of study of the Holy Spirit, at times I've struggled with, well, when exactly do we get the Holy Spirit? Uh, the Holy Spirit is in, in, in the whole human race, and what, to one extent, you know, our very life breath comes from the Spirit of God. Um, but at the same time, there seems to be a special anointing of the Spirit that comes on believers. Well, when does that happen? Well, uh, what, what we see here in the beginning of Acts is that uh, although the early disciples had experienced the Spirit's power when they were sent out to do their mission and they were alive and had the Spirit of God and they, they knew right from wrong, which is also the work of the Spirit. Jesus still said to them they needed to wait for a special anointing of the Spirit. And so that may be helpful to some of us today as we think about the Holy Spirit and, and wanting the Spirit to be part of our lives, looking for the Spirit, praying, praying for the Spirit, to become more a part of our life, even though already the Spirit is part of your life. Okay, so what else do you see in these verses that's important? To be a witness, absolutely. He's calling that, that the call to be a witness to the world, the whole world, uh, is, is going to be a very important theme for the book of Acts. Uh, I think sometimes today churches think that their mission is just to provide a, a ritual, provide services, worship services, care for the people in their congregation, and all that's true. But originally, the mission was a call to go out into all the world and share the gospel. This is why in, in my practical theology classes, uh, when I talk about the purpose of the church, we talk about worship, we talk about care and support of believers, fellowship. We talk about education and training, thirdly. But we always talk about mobilizing for mission. Because that's the example we see in the book of Acts. All right? And one other major theme. The kingdom. Restoring the kingdom. All right? And so, uh, and I mentioned this before, that, that Luke understood the coming of Jesus as the means by which God was going to restore Israel. Now, contrary to the expectations of most of the Jewish people, it was not a political kingdom that was going to be established, run by the existing Jewish hierarchy and rulers. It was something new that God was going to do through Jesus Christ, through the work of the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, what this kingdom is, is a spiritual kingdom made up of real human people human beings of course but these are this kingdom is not about political boundaries like like the ancient land of Israel it's about all those who know Jesus Christ and believe in Jesus Christ who have repented of their sins and have been filled with the Holy Spirit that's the kingdom of God that that Luke that's how Luke interprets the Old Testament prophecies of the restoration of the kingdom. Okay. All right, so I have here several notes here. One other point that we haven't made yet uh, under this, uh, these uh, uh, main themes of the book is that as the Davidic Messiah, the risen Christ is clearly God's faithful provision of redemption of Israel. The kingdom of God has begun now and is to be completed at some point in the future. Let's talk now about the theology. First of all, God the Father occupies the dominant place according to uh, biblical scholar Martin Hengel. And I, you've heard me say many times that if we read the, the whole New Testament witness, it's very Trinitarian. The word Trinity isn't in the Bible, and so that concept had not been developed at the time of the New Testament, the writing of the New Testament. 
But the reason it was developed years later is because it's so clearly in the New Testament. And, and so when we talk about our salvation, Jesus is the Savior that never changes. But, but for some of the writers, they still will say God is the one who saves us. Jesus died for us, saved us, so that we can have a relationship with God the Father. We find in, in certainly in Paul, but elsewhere as well, as well this idea that, that through Christ we have, Christ's Spirit, we have the ability to call out Abba, which is Father. And so remember that as you're doing your theology. That even in the preaching of the gospel that was so Christ-centered, God the Father was always the dominant role. God is the creator, and God the Father is seen as the creator, and Jesus Christ makes that relationship possible. Now, now let's talk about Christology and redemption, because that, that's what's preached. Well, first of all, Jesus was not necessarily pre-existent in Luke. And we see that in John, or we will see that when we talk about John next, that Jesus was clearly pre-existent. But we don't necessarily see that in Luke, Luke Acts. But he was a human being attested by God. In other words, God affirmed via the resurrection that Jesus Christ really is the Son of God. Let's look at a few of these verses here just so you can see what I'm talking about. We can look at chapter 2 verses 22 through 24 verses 32 through 34 and verse 36. What should we take from these verses? And this is just one example in Acts. This is very important for your own Christology. Uh, and, and, and for our purposes, of course, we're talking about Luke's Christology. But ultimately, as we've said many times, you're going to be developing your own Christology based on the biblical text. So, first of all, what does he say about Jesus? Where does he begin? Who is Jesus? What? Jesus of Nazareth. By God. Yeah, accredited by God. So it means God credits him, or a, a, there are different translations here, attested by God, uh, accredited by God. Um, in other words, God worked through this man in a unique way to make a testimony to you. But remember what I said to you before, I think it was one or two lectures ago, maybe it was on, on, in Mark. I said that whenever we say Jesus of Nazareth, that's a reference to the historical earthly Jesus. But when we say Jesus the Christ, or just Christ, it's often a reference today, anyway, to the resurrected Lord. And when, when Paul talks about Christ or Jesus Christ, he's almost always talking about the resurrected uh, Lord. But when you see Jesus of Nazareth in the Bible, as I said before, think earthly Jesus. So he's now talking about Jesus in his earthly life during his three years of ministry. And what he's saying is that, yes, this was a, a human being. Again, we don't know about pre-existence. He doesn't say anything about it. He's not saying he wasn't pre-existent. He just doesn't say anything. Because for Luke, what seems to be important is to say he was a man that everybody knew from this world. But... He was unlike any other man, not because of his own power, but where did his power come from? From God, okay? Again, some of you are going to be confused by this, because you were raised in the church where you say, well, Jesus is God, what do you mean? Okay. Now, when we say Jesus is God, that is something we, we have learned to say because the church spent a couple of centuries thinking about, two or three centuries thinking about, well, who is Jesus? How should we talk about him? And so now we talk about God is three persons in one. And so many of you in your churches, you just simply say what Christians have said for hundreds of years, Jesus is God. 
But try for a minute here to put yourself back in the first century. And if you heard stories about Jesus, you wouldn't be hearing stories about, G about God. You'd be hearing a story about an incredible man, historical person, who lived in Jerusalem. Well, before well, he died in Jerusalem. Before that, he lived in Nazareth. And some say born in Bethlehem. And the reason I'm telling you this story, I mean, if, if I'm in the first century, and I'm telling you the story. So the reason I'm telling you the story is I want you to know about this incredible man. I'm not going to tell you about a God. I'm telling you about a man in history that you need to know about. Well, what about this man? Well, this man was chosen by God to experience the power of God so powerfully that he worked miracles and wonders and signs among us among the people through him. See, now you're listening and going, yes, that, that's, that's amazing. Tell me about this man, Jesus. All right, tell me more about him. And then he goes on and he says, well, this man, verse 23, this man was handed over to you, but by God's plan and foreknowledge. So in other words, what happened in this man's life wasn't an accident. It wasn't bad luck. Bad luck for Jesus. Poor guy. You know, I was like, well, it was a bad thing, you know, humanly speaking, but it was part of God's plan. That's Luke's teaching. And you, meaning he's talking to, to the Israelites, you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. So now the people he's talking to are in Jerusalem. They know the story already. But now the preacher, Peter, is, is trying to offer an interpretation of who this man was that they already know. See, if he started his story and say, I want to tell you a story about God, they're not going to think about Jesus. They're going to think about the God of the Old Testament. He's starting with the person they know and killed. And as he goes on, and the story says, but God raised him from the dead. Because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. 32, God raised this Jesus to life and we're all witnesses of it. So he must, he's saying the preachers are witnesses, but the listeners, I don't think we can, should believe that all of them saw Jesus. So they're hearing about the story. And it says he was exalted to the right hand of God. And then the conclusion is, therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, this man, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. All right, this is just a snapshot of the kind of preaching that took place in the early church. And it, it, again, it's different than the, than the preaching you had in your church. Because you heard the story... God sent his son into the world to die for you. You put your faith in him and you will have eternal life. Well, that's an appropriate story. But that makes more sense to Gentiles. This is the version of the story told to the Jews who knew Jesus. So I want you to notice one other thing. I want you to notice the movement. The movement from a man who lived in Nazareth to a place where he had popularity and prominence among the people because of, of the miracles and signs and wonders. And so he rose to this place of popularity and power, but then he, he descended rapidly to the lowest position because they killed him. But then he was suddenly raised to the high, even higher position by the power of God, which is the resurrection. And then Paul adds, excuse me, Peter adds to that, that he was also exalted to the right hand of God. And now... God made him, the man God chose, to do this, this, this. God chose him to be the Messiah and the Lord of the world. And so that, that was how they understood him. That's Luke's theology, understanding of how and why we worship Jesus as Lord and Messiah. Because God chose him to be in that role. Uh, and so the Frank Matera says, Jesus became the Christ of faith. 
because God raised him from the dead. And so that's who we worship today. Point number two, forgiveness clearly is through faith in Jesus, but there's no doctrine of atonement. Let me give you just a few verses here that are relevant. Chapter 13, verses 32 through, well, let's go all the way to 39. Why we can have forgiveness through Jesus. That's what I mean. There's no doctrine of atonement. And But what he's testifying to is that the message, the gospel message from the beginning was that through Jesus, presumably through his death and resurrection, and through faith in Jesus, we can have forgiveness of sins. And so this is also is, is discussed in, uh, uh, in modern scholarship today, has often discussed, well actually throughout time, how it is that we have forgiveness through Jesus. But right now we're not going to talk about the doctrine of atonement. But simply notice that for Luke it seemed to be sufficient simply to say through Jesus comes forgiveness of sins. He's talking here to a Jewish context because he says that everyone who believes, so here's the faith component, is set free from every sin. A justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. There in Paul we saw that the law was insufficient to bring salvation. Salvation is really by faith. Abraham had that faith and, and now Christians were called to have faith in Christ, uh, not faith in the works of the law. And so we see here in Luke saying the same thing, is that justification simply couldn't happen by under the law of Moses. And, and so the good news about Christ that's being preached in Jerusalem is that now forgiveness of sins really is possible, but it comes through Jesus. And what does that mean? We, as I said, we don't totally know what it means, but at the very least it means faith. Because through him, everyone who believes is set free. And again, I think we should look to Galatians, Paul's writing, perhaps Paul's influence, to understand what this means. It's through faith that, that we have forgiveness through faith in Christ who is, who is doing the work of God. Okay, what are the implications of this portrayal of Jesus and this understanding of redemption? Well, I listed a couple of things there in your guide. First of all, the nature of, uh, the, excuse me, that, that there may have been more than one way in the early church to understand a the nature of Jesus sonship and this is nothing new uh, you may have read this in, in or heard about this in your theology classes but some people think about Jesus as the Son of God through adoption so did God see Jesus or choose Jesus to adopt him as a son or as John portrays him was he really existed before the beginning of time and so he was incarnated that means in the flesh God in the flesh well that's what the early church concluded but is that in the the biblical text or is it actually a divine conception in other words through as Luke portrays that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and then Jesus was born from the Holy Spirit that's Luke's view also, there may have been more than one way in the early church to understand the means of Jesus' providing for our forgiveness. This, I've already said this, but I'm just summarizing it. Uh, perhaps it's a theologia gloria versus a theologia cruxis in Acts. In other words, it's, it's the theology of, of glory, of, of Christ's triumph over death that brings us salvation rather than the theology of the cross that he died he died for our sins that's so evident in Paul's teaching in any case regardless of our answers to those questions about when he became a son and how he provides salvation Luke affirms that Jesus he is the son of God he affirms that Jesus was resurrected from the dead he affirms that Jesus is the means of justification. 
in a way that the law could not provide. That's with Paul. And that this justification is received through faith or belief in him. And that is very, very consistent with, with whatever I'm sure you were taught in your churches uh, growing up. Frank Matera says, For Luke, the resurrection of Jesus is the decisive act that affects salvation. So even if we can't fully answer some of those other questions, the resurrection continues to be very, very dominant in the minds of our biblical writers, and Luke is no exception. Number four, Jesus is the promised Davidic Messiah, a savior for the Gentiles and Jews, the one who will redeem Israel, as clearly portrayed from the infancy narratives, Luke chapter one and two, and through the preaching of the apostles in, the, in Acts. Five, the resurrected Jesus is enthroned as the Messiah and thus Lord. So again, this idea of Messiah as a political ruler on earth is not the image that, that Luke gives us. Someday he will be that, but now this Messiah is the ruler, but he is enthroned in heaven alongside of God. Frank Matera says, the moral life begins with repentance that leads to faith, baptism, and new life defined by the gift of the Spirit. All right, becoming a Christian. Um, there's no systematic teaching on how one becomes a Christian, uh, except we know that metanoia, which means forget repentance, is required, and pastusai, which means to believe, uh, is important. Note that the gift of the Holy Spirit comes with repentance and belief. And the promise ex is extended to children. And this provides the basis for infant baptism. Now, most of you in my MIT class here are Baptists, and you don't believe in belie infant baptism. But what we're, what we're going to look at here in a minute in Acts is, is the basis for infant baptism, or one of the bases for infant baptism. So let's look at Acts chapter 2, verses 38 to 40. Okay, there's a lot in these few verses. This comes at the very end of Peter's long sermon, where he basically says, we looked at part of it, that this Jesus of Nazareth did wonders, miracles, you crucified him, God brought him back to life. And so now, and they want to know, well, what should we do to be saved? And we see that in the earlier verses here, if we go back to 36. Uh, we read 36 already, but in 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. You know what that means, like convicted of their sins. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? So let's say, if you're going to be uh, ministering or pastoring using the Acts model, and somebody comes to you and says, you know, I'm a, I'm a wicked person, I'm, I'm a bad person, what should I do? What would you say to them, according to these verses? Repent. Repent, Repent. yes, which means turn from your sins. In other words, we, that, what does that mean? Renounce it. Say, I reject that, I reject that way of life, I reject that sin. In this case, they had to repent of their lack of belief in Jesus. And, so, and that's even relevant today. Some of us, some, some people are stubbornly atheistic. They're stubbornly agnostic. They refuse to believe. Not because logically they can't. That's a different type of person. But a person who just doesn't want to believe in Jesus. And so for that person, or the person who just feels trapped in their sins, they need to repent and say, I'm sorry, this is wrong. I don't want to do it. Okay, that's first. Repent. And then? Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So again, this is really important practically. If somebody says, I want to be a Christian, you don't say, well, come to church. Join the church. I mean, that's important. But you have to give them the simple, clear message. Because salvation isn't about just being a member of the church. 
There has to be repentance. We have to bend our knee and say, God, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I submit myself to you. I want to be right. And, that, and I know I need forgiveness. So don't preach members, church membership. Don't preach join our cause. Don't preach, well, be a good person. That's not what the Bible teaches. Certainly not what Luke teaches. Repent, yes. Ask for forgiveness. One of the things we talk about from time to time is, is the contrast between Buddhism and Christianity. And I had the privilege here recently of, of talking to a, um, a young student, uh, a young adult student, who grew up as a Buddhist, but just recently learned about the Christian gospel. And what he discovered, as, as many others have discovered, is there is no forgiveness of sins in, in Buddhism. And that was what was so attractive to him about Christianity. So again, I will say what I say many times, that when you're doing your interfaith dialogue, and you're learning about Buddhism, learn all about it, and that's a good thing. But don't assume that Buddhism offers the same things that Christianity does. It doesn't. It has some things that are the same. But the most important thing is Jesus Christ and forgiveness of sins and eternal salvation. And you can't get any of that in this other religion. So be sure you're valuing what you have, the treasure you have in your Christian faith. And be sure that you, when you're preaching and teaching and pastoring, that you are talk, speaking the truth about what's offered and what is written about in the Bible. And it really makes a difference. And I wish I could bring this, this young man to you so you could see the joy in his faith. And it's not the first time I've had this experience. For someone who, for the first time, experiences forgiveness and faith in Christ and comes to know God the Father. And so this is a very real and practical story, a, a practical implication of this, of this historical story for us today. And so, they're cut to the heart. That's a sign of the Holy Spirit. Peter gives them a clear message. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus um, and for the forgiveness of sins. And then you will receive the gift of... Holy Spirit. Yeah, the gift of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> We're talking about that all day. <laughs> now you receive the gift of the Spirit. So in, in, in Luke's theology... The Spirit, even if the Spirit's active in the world, and the Spirit is, there's still like a, a reception of the Spirit, an anointing of the Spirit that comes only to those who repent and put their faith in Jesus Christ. So don't be confused on this subject. There is, there is a reception of the Spirit that, that doesn't come just from birth or even from infant baptism. Uh, I think this comes from this experience of giving your life to Christ. Trusting in Christ. And then in verse 39 he says, This promise is for you and your children. And that's where in the Catholic tradition, Anglican tradition, Presbyterian tradition, Methodist tradition, uh, they say, look, this is, we believe in infant baptism. Because the promise is for the children too. So Baptists might ask, well, why don't we believe in that? Uh, it's because that the examples of baptism in the Gospels are always of adults. And because it's accompanied with teaching about repentance and about trusting in Jesus, an infant can't repent or put their trust in Jesus. And so that's why... Uh, because that is important and part of the biblical witness, that's why the Catholics and Anglicans and Presbyterians and Methodists also have confirmation. So at some point, that infant, even though he or she was baptized and included under the covenant of protection, honoring this verse, they also recognize that they have to confirm their faith as an adult. And so we might say that all Christian traditions believe in a personal confession of faith in Christ and they believe in baptism. Only some traditions do baptism first and then confession. Baptists switch it around. They say confession comes first and baptism. All right? And then, so your tradition will determine really which way you go. But I want to assure you that 
all Christian traditions have both components in them because it's so clearly biblical and that's been the tradition of the church from the, from the very beginning. All right. Uh, I think that's enough on these important verses. Um, Matera has a little bit of a discussion about what repentance means to different people in different contexts. And he says, for the inhabitants in Jerusalem, repentance means believing in the one they first rejected. That's Jesus. But for the Gentiles, repentance means turning to the living God, turning away from their false idols to the true God. And we see Paul making a very clear statement about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. For the diaspora Jews and God-fearers, repentance means turning to Jesus as the Messiah. And for all, repentance means doing deeds consistent with repentance. Can everybody find this in your notes? Yes. Do you see this? This is under C, becoming a Christian. Point C. Uh, so, we're, we're under theology. A was God the Father. B is Christology and redemption. Point C is becoming a Christian. And then you see Matera teaching on, on re, the meanings of repentance. It's different for different people. Um, but again, that shouldn't bother you because repentance simply means turning away from what's wrong to what's right. And you... Different people in different contexts, it has different content, but it's still the basic movement is away from what's wrong to God and what's right. So now let's focus now on the Holy Spirit. Pneumatology. The Holy Spirit's a gift that every Christian receives at baptism, according to Acts chapter 2, for the most part. That means not always, but generally speaking. And that's why most Christian traditions affirm that in baptism they receive the Holy Spirit. But you know very well that the Pentecostals do not believe that. The charismatic movement does not say that. And they take more from the, some of the examples in Acts that, that the Holy Spirit comes with power on people at a separate point. And, and so this has been a, a real debate, especially the last 150 years in the church as when exactly does the baptism of the Holy Spirit come? Is it something that's quiet at the moment of conversion? Is it something that's powerful and loud uh, in a special anointing? Well, to go back to Acts, apart from our answer to that question, the Holy Spirit is the equipment possessed by individual Christians for a given task at a particular moment. And so this is what we see in the testimony of Acts is sometimes the Spirit will come upon people to give them an ability to do something that needs to be done. It's also that which gives, this is according to Matera, that which gives specific direction for the Christian mission at important junctures. In other words, for example, in Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas were praying and worshiping and somebody gave a word of the Lord to them that said, sent them, said, you need to go back and out to the mission field again. And, and so the Holy Spirit can function that way as well. There were some exceptions reported about baptism and the reception of the Spirit. Some people did not receive the Spirit when they were baptized in the name of Jesus. But later on, Apostles, or one of the apostles came and laid hands on them and they received the, the, the Holy Spirit in a separate time. So what are the implications for today? Well, let me just make a few comments about that. First of all, if we take the teaching of Luke as normative for us, at least his main points, not every story, but his general teaching, we can affirm that Luke is teaching the same thing that Paul taught. The Holy Spirit's essential for the believer's life. So we as Baptists traditionally have not emphasized the Holy Spirit. Some of you come from Baptist churches that refuse to talk about the Holy Spirit because you don't want to sound Pentecostal. But that, that's, that is an overreaction. It's not biblical. 
There is no Christianity without the Holy Spirit. And that's a consistent witness, certainly of Luke and Gospel and Acts and throughout Paul. And it's also in the other Gospels, but it's particularly in, the, in these. It's essential. The Holy Spirit's essential. Second, however, Acts is descriptive rather than prescriptive. Do you remember we talked about that? I think we talked about that in this course. Uh, it comes up later when we talk about hermeneutics. But that means that some of the stories in the Bible, do you remember that? They just describe what happened. That doesn't mean that we're supposed to do it that way. You know, one of the examples in the Old Testament is when Jephthah made a vow to God. He said, the first person that comes out of my house, I'm going to offer a sacrifice to you. And the first person that comes out is who? His daughter. But he felt like he had to offer his daughter as a sacrifice. Well, is that prescriptive for us? No. <laughs> Certainly God doesn't want us to sacrifice our children, you know, kill them. It just describes what happened. And we're supposed to draw a lesson from that. Well, A, we have to keep our vows to God. That's true. But B, don't make foolish vows that get you in trouble and your poor daughter in trouble. All right? So that's the lesson from that. So in other words, it's descriptive, so we learn from it, but we don't imitate it. And so in the stories in Acts, we should always ask the question, is this descriptive or prescriptive? Do we have to do it that way? Or should we just learn from those stories? And we find, I think, both in, in Acts. Um, thus, I think there is not a mandate that everyone has an identical experience of the Holy Spirit. Some experience this way, some experience that way. All of us are supposed to experience the Spirit, though. And again, to make this uh, really clear, in our contact, modern context, I believe a whole lot more work needs to be done in our Baptist, among our Baptist churches on the role of the Holy Spirit. Um, maybe that's true in the Anglican Church as well. I don't know in the Catholic Church. Uh, we have the like, Holy Spirit Day, like the Pentecost uh, Day. We have. Mm -hmm. We celebrate it. Do you talk about how the believers can experience the Holy Spirit? Yes. Yeah, wonderful. Well, it's needed. But how many, do, do you do that in the Baptist churches? Do you talk about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit can help you and work through you? Just, just a little bit, maybe. How about your church? I think the same. Same, a little bit, yeah. So I'm hoping that one of the things you take from our New Testament theology class is that, the, that very likely the Holy Spirit needs to be emphasized, understood and emphasized more in your church. But you need to do some research. You need to do some thinking about what does that mean so that you can really be helpful to the people of a church. Also, so you can be helpful to you because you need the Holy Spirit as well in order for you to, to find more freedom from sin, the power of sin, more power in your preaching, more experience of the joy of the Spirit. I'm not even talking about speaking in tongues and miracles. I'm talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit for fruitful ministry. Uh, that's all over the Bible, all over the New Testament. For doing New Testament theology, point C in your guide, Paul's more specific teaching on life and the Spirit should take precedence, that means it's more important, over Acts narrative. Informing one's opinion about the role of the Holy Spirit in one's life and in the church, various gifts and the general fruit of the Holy Spirit are key. Whereas speaking in tongues is minor in the long run and not necessarily available to all people. And I know many, many Christians who have never spoken in tongues. But I also know many people who have. So don't dismiss it, but don't require it. And, and that's kind of a middle way um, because the Pentecostals require it. Not as a law, but they, they believe that you, you haven't really experienced what God wants for you unless you've experienced the fullness of the Spirit. Um, but there are other, on the other, others on the other extreme that say, no, that was just for the first century, it's not for today. And I don't think that's true either. Um, informing one's opinion about the role of the Spirit, uh, I mentioned that already, uh, 
okay, I think I've already covered point C. Point D is that at the same time, many report that a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit has been transformative for their relationship with God and their ability to minister effectively for Christ. Likewise, praying in tongues is a meaningful way for many Christians to communicate with God. So, what I'm saying by this last point is, just because I said not everybody speaks in tongues, that doesn't mean you should say, okay, then I'm not going to worry about it. Um, I know my response when I read about this in the New Testament is, I want to know more about it. And so over the last 35 years of my life, I, I have sought out charismatic people, charismatic worship, read books about the Spirit, and have had different kinds of experiences with the Holy Spirit, and including some speaking in tongues for me and including learning how to discern the Spirit's leading and how to say yes to God and in more quiet ways. And I hope to learn more and more about it and to experience more in the future years. And that's my prayer for you also as, as pastors and leaders, that you too will experience more and more of the Spirit's power. Because that really is what makes the difference in our ministries and in our ability to love other people. The greatest mark of the Holy Spirit, again, is not the tongues or signs or wonders, it's love. And so our calling, your calling, my calling to love other people is, is really dependent upon the Holy Spirit working through you. So find out what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And on that note, we'll end our, our lecture on Luke Acts for today. And I will invite you now to be thinking about what impression uh, Luke's theology makes on you. What questions do you have? And where do you think you're going to go in your own thinking and research as a result of what we talked about today? Uh, and then we'll discuss that as a group later on.